Hey, what's up guys? This is Sam Burgess coming at you with another philosophy video. In today's video, I interview Professor Shelley Kagan. More specifically, uh, in this interview, Professor Kagan explains what utilitarianism is, some arguments in favor of utilitarianism, as well as some objections that one might raise against utilitarianism. Towards the end of the video, Professor Kagan also offers some book recommendations for those who would like to learn more about utilitarianism. But yeah, that's all I have to say, guys. Uh, enjoy the video. Okay. All right. So um, you gave me the broad uh, topic, but I'll take you. You're, you're in the lead. Ask whatever you want, and I'll just blather at you. Right. Yeah. So um, I just want to talk about utilitarianism generally. Um, uh, like, you know, what is utilitarianism? Uh, what are some arguments in favor of it? Some objections like those type of things. That's kind of like the way I wanted to like um, this podcast thing to go because um, I know I myself I lean more in towards a utilitarian point of view. So like this is the ethical theory I find most interesting. So that's why I wanted to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you want me to sketch an argument for utilitarianism or rather since you yourself already expressed sympathy for utilitarianism should I take the other side and give you an argument against utilitarianism well how about you just uh, explain how you understand what utilitarianism is alright so I, I think uh, utilitarianism is basically what you get when you combine two views um, one view uh, the first view uh, nowadays in philosophy gets called consequentialism and this is the thought that right and wrong is basically a matter of doing the action that will lead to the best results. Um, where we need to talk about the results for everybody, not just the results for me. Sometimes people use the word, so, so on that use of the word consequentialism, egoistic views don't count as consequentialist because they're only paying attention to uh, right and wrong results as a matter of results, what's good or bad for me. Some people use the word consequentialism broadly enough to cover egoism. Uh, and then we need to distinguish between what we might call egoistic versions of consequentialism and more universalistic versions of consequentialism. I just follow the convention where we, I reserve the word consequentialism for the universalistic versions. So here's the first basic thought. Right and wrong is a matter of the consequences. You've got to pay attention to the consequences for everybody. The right thing to do is the action's got the best consequences. Now that theory, that claims got a lot going for it. It's pretty attractive, pretty plausible. A lot of people find it pretty intuitive. They may stop finding it intuitive once you see some of its implications, but at least considered in its own right, it seems to be a pretty compelling thought. Um, second thought, though. The first thought, I mean, that consequentialist claim can't be a complete moral theory because you need some yardstick for telling the good results from the bad results, the good outcome from the bad outcome. And so you need what philosophers sometimes call a theory of the good. What is it that makes one set of results or one outcome better or worse than another? And here's a proposal that in judging which outcome is better or worse morally in this universal way, we need to take into account well-being, welfare um, for uh, me and welfare for you and indeed welfare for everything, everybody's welfare. Uh, and so... Roughly speaking, the goodness of a uh, outcome is just a function of the well-being of all the relevant individuals that, you know, in that outcome, so, something like that. So in assessing two different uh, worlds, which one's the better world, I look and see, roughly speaking, you know, are the individuals, are the people more well-off of the one rather than the other? Now, that still leaves, obviously other things that need to be filled in, we need to know, well, what's the correct theory of well-being? You know, is the hedonist right? Uh, it's just a matter of pleasure and pain or our preference theorist right? And is well-being a matter of having what you want or our perfectionist correct? And there's a list of things that it's good for you to have. So there are different in-house debates about what welfare consists of. But if we take the view that says, the goodness of an outcome is just a function of the, let's suppose it's the total amount of well-being, um, whatever exactly well-being is, it's the matter of the total well-being. We could call that view welfareism, you know, if again, for kind of obvious reasons. 
We might wonder whether it's just the welfare of people or the welfare of animals. We might wonder what welfare exactly exists. We might wonder, is it a matter of adding up the, the, all the welfare to get the total, or is it a matter of the average amount of welfare? You know, what's the right mathematical function that takes you from individual judgments of welfare to some assessment about the outcome as a whole, taking everybody's welfare into account? These are in-house debates, which, you know, we would need to actually work out as well. But, but suppose that on the one hand, you're a consequentialist, so you need a theory of the good, and you basically think the correct theory of the good is the welfarest one. All that really matters is well-being. Then, combine this with the consequentialist thought, we've now said the right action is the action that brings about the best consequences. We're going to assess the consequences in terms of looking at the, let's suppose, total for simplicity, the total amount of well-being, counting everybody's well-being, that view, consequentialism plus welfareism, just is utilitarianism. So if you ask, what's utilitarianism? It's the combination of these two views. If you ask, why would anybody be drawn to utilitarianism? It's because both of these views are pretty plausible ones. That morality is ultimately a matter of making things better. And if you want to know what's the yardstick that how helps us judge good outcomes from bad outcomes, it's how well off are the people, right? So these two views are pretty plausible. You combine them, and that's the utilitarian position. There are still in-house debates among utilitarians. Should we be hedonists? Should we be desire theorists? You know, so, so we talk about hedonic or hedonistic utilitarians. People who accept desire theories of well-being are sometimes called preference uh, utilitarians. A lot of economists are preference utilitarians. Mill was a was a hedonistic uh, utilitarian, as was as was Bentham. Um, but you could be a perfectionist utilitarian. Depending on your aggregation function, you might be a total utilitarian, you might be an average utilitarian, it might be some more complicated rule. Um, the contemporary utilitarian uh, parfit, um, uh, at least in one stage, you know, wasn't sure what the aggregation function should be. This was something he explored a lot. But anyway, that's why utilitarianism is an attractive, perennially attractive view. It's based on some pretty attractive thoughts. If you're a desire theory utilitarian versus like a hedonistic utilitarian, how might those two different types of utilitarians come to different conclusions about morality? Well, they differ on this theoretical issue, right? Is well-being a function of whether you're having, uh, you know, pleasures and pains or whether your, your desires are being satisfied? In one place they come apart, and this is a very famous thought experiment. I know in your email you say, any cool thought experiments? <laughs> Here's one. Uh, it's Nozick's experience machine. Are you familiar with the experience machine thought experiment? Right? Yes, so that's but it'd be good to talk about it. For, all right, for so, the all right. The podcast so, thing. so, so Nozick, you know, no longer alive, but he taught at Harvard for many, many years. Uh, said we could imagine that super duper neuropsychologists. I think he even used the word super duper. Uh, super duper ne- uh, neuropsychologists have figured out a way to directly stimulate your brain so as to create any mental state we want. And so in the example I always use, you know, if you're running the climbing Mount Everest program, then it will feel exactly as though you'll have exactly the same mental states that you would have if you really were climbing Mount Everest. You'll see, quote unquote, see uh, uh, the Himalayas going off into the distance. You'll remember, quote unquote, remember, uh, you know, the, the, the difficulty of climbing to the peak. You know, you'll feel, quote unquote, feel uh, the wind uh, bracing across, you know, your exposed cheeks and so forth. It's all the mental states will be exactly the same. And indeed, since the crucial point here is exactly the same, you won't know that it's all fake. You won't know that you're on the experience machine because this has given you exactly the same experiences. And when you're on the experience machine, you think when you're on Mount Everest, you think I'm on Mount Everest. So when you're in the experience machine, you will think, I'm on Mount Everest. You won't be, but you'll think it. All right. Now, we could argue about what program to run on the machine would be the best program. That's a very interesting thought experiment uh, to, uh, I sometimes conduct with uh, audiences, of especially you know, non-students, just to get them to see about what do they care about? What do they think are the best kinds of experiences? But the crucial point in terms of the debate that we're having right now between desire theorists and hedonists is that if you're playing the best program, the hedonist has to say life on the experience machine is wonderful. There's nothing missing. It's a picture of an ideal or perfect human life. Um, but a lot of people don't want to sign up for the experience machine. This was, of course, Nozick's point in creating it. And 
I certainly have asked this of thousands and thousands of people over the course of my career. And although there's always a small handful who will sign up for the experience machine, most people, the overwhelming majority of people say, no, no, that life's missing something really important. And if it is missing something important, then the hedonist must be wrong because it's giving you all the best kinds of pleasures and avoiding all the, you know, the, the worst pains. A desire theorist can say what's missing. Uh, the desire theorist can say, well, you know, you were, you wanted certain things. You wanted to be on Mount Everest, but you're not on Mount Everest, so you don't have what you want. So if a desire theory of well-being is correct, you don't really have, have a great life. And so that's a place where they differ uh, and uh, it at least shows that we can have intuitions about the two different kinds of theories about well-being. Of course, there are other theories, and there are various responses hedonists can give in, you know, in, re- in response to the experience machine thought experiment. So like everything else in philosophy, it remains contentious, but at least that's an instance where um, there'll be uh, a difference that we can get a feel for by thinking about that thought experiment. And it may even have some practical implications as well. Aldous Huxley in Brave New World um, envisioned that people spent a lot of their time basically on drugs. Um, Soma was the drug of choice. Uh, And uh, (coughs) so if you're a hedonist, it's not obvious whether you've got an answer to that. Uh, Of course, there are in-house debates among hedonists, and some hedonists will have better answers than others. But anyway, yeah, so these differences are not only theoretically interesting to think about, but they may have some practical implications as well. I guess I don't see the difference between, or maybe not a difference. When I think about, like, pain, for example, what is pain? I think pain is, like, a sensation whose absence is, like, intrinsically desired, right? So I'm not sure, it's not obvious to me that pain and and sorry, that well-being and desires are like this separate thing. Does that make sense? Well, yes, I and mean, I see that the, the, they're certainly connected, right? In the typical case, if you want something uh, and you have it, uh, it exists, obtains, as the logicians sometimes put it, uh, or the desire is satisfied in the logical sense, that is, the object of your desire exists, well, when you realize this, then you have a feeling of satisfaction. Um, and so there's a certain kind of pleasure that we get when we uh, believe our desires are satisfied. Uh, and if we believe our desires are not satisfied, then this leads to a feeling of dissatisfaction, an unpleasant mental state. So there's clearly you know, connections here. But for all that, the desire theorist says the question is, were your desires actually satisfied, not did you have the feelings? And the hedonist says, the question is, did you have the feelings, not were the desires actually satisfied? And the experience machine shows how these things can, in principle, come apart. Um, On the experience machine, you think you've got what you want. You think you're on Mount Everest, which is what you were imagining you want. So you've got the feeling of satisfaction, but you're not really on Mount Everest. So your desire wasn't actually satisfied in the logician sense. You have the feeling of satisfaction but not logical satisfaction of the desire. And so if you're not happy, if if we think I wouldn't sign up on the experience machine, that's not the kind of life I want for myself, then you're saying feelings, mental states, pleasures, that's not the only stuff that I want. To put the point in terms of a slightly different metaphor, the experience machine gets the insides right. Um, It's giving you the right experiences, but it doesn't get the outsides right. It doesn't actually put you on Mount Everest. Now, of course, even people who agree that the experience machine is missing something important, so the outsides count and not just the insides, philosophers disagree about what's the right account. The desire account is one account that makes the outsides count, but it's not the only account that makes the outsides count. And so there'll be other arguments we need to have about what's the right theory about which outsides matter, why do the outsides matter, how do they matter. If you have to choose between insides and outsides, how do we trade off between these things? Because nobody's going to want to say the insides don't matter. The question is, are they the only thing that matters? In your view, what's the more plausible version of utilitarianism, the hedonistic view or the preference view? So I don't actually believe either of these uh, theories. So again, the question here is one that's an in-house debate. You can be a utilitarian, be a hedonist utilitarian. You can be a preference theory utilitarian. 
If you have some other view, I'll share my view in a moment. And this debate isn't limited to utilitarians, right? Non-utilitarians, every moral theory needs a theory of well-being. Because on any plausible theory, well-being is at least one of the things that matters. The welfareist says it's the only thing that matters, but you can deny that and think that other things matter too, and yet still think, of course, it's one of the things that matters, so you still need a theory of well-being. So everybody needs a theory of well-being. My own view is what sometimes gets called a hybrid or a mixed view. And on that view, I, I, what I mean, my own view, I mean the view I'm sympathetic to. I don't mean I dreamt it up. There are other people who propose views like this. Uh, the, the correct theory says some things are just worth having. They're just objectively good. So we'll call these things objective goods. And if you are in the fortunate situation where your life has the object, the relevant objective goods, and you get pleasure from the having of these objective goods, you are pleased that you have these objective goods, then uh, that's what well-being consists in. So there's a kind of hedonistic element, and there's an external outsides element, and it's a mixture of these two, but it's not just that you've got to have the one and you have to have the other. They have to be connected in the right way. You've got to be enjoying the possession of these objectively good things. And so what's wrong with the experience machine is you think you've got the objective goods and you're pleased, but you don't really have them. So on this hybrid view, you're not really well off. And in other cases, we could dream up. You might have these objective goods in your life, but you don't realize that You've got them, so you're not pleased, okay? Then you're not well off. That's one of the ways that desire theory can go wrong. You can have the things that you want and not realize it. The desire theorist has to say you're well off. Yeah, that's not good enough. Another theory, another case would be one where you've got the objective goods, you realize it, but you don't want them. Then there's something off there as well. So you know, the, the theory I like, in effect, draws on elements from other, the more familiar theories, and says, it's not good enough to just want any old thing. You've got to want the things that are worth having, and you've got to realize you've got them so that you're enjoying having them, and then well-being is this pleasure you take in the possession of these objectively good things. Uh, so that's the kind of theory that I endorse. I call it well-being as enjoying the good, other people have put forward theories like that, though there's no standard name for that view in the literature. That's what I call the view. And you could plug that into a welfareist view. Yeah, so a theory, an outcome is good if as many people as possible are having this high degree of enjoyment in the possession of objective goods. Um, and uh, so you could be a utilitarian with that kind of theory, but it's not hedonistic well utilitarianism, it's not preference utilitarianism, it's this other non familiar, less familiar version of utilitarianism. Maybe call that like objective list view utilitarianism? Yeah, it's not quite objective list uh, theory either because an objective list comes close. An objective list says, here are five, eight, ten things that are worth having in your life. And I took an element of that over. I said, you've got to have the things that are genuinely worth having from off the objective list. The trouble is that an objective list theory where does pleasure come into the objective list theory? Well, presumably it's one of the things that belongs on the list. Um, pleasure is good, but it's not the only thing that's good. Knowledge is good. It's not the only thing that's good. Achievement is good. It's not the only thing that's good. Friendship is good. It's not the only thing that's good, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. Well, to have the best life, you got to have all of these things. You might say this objective list theory. But imagine somebody who's got nine out of ten things. They've got all the things on the list except for pleasure. If so... That's a pretty good score, 90, you know, out of 100. And so an objective list theorist has to say, that's a pretty good life. They've got friendship. Yeah, they hate it. They're miserable, but they've got friendship. they got love. Yeah, they don't care about love. They're miserable, but they've got love. They've got knowledge. Yeah, but they don't care about knowledge. So they're miserable, right? And I find it very strange to say that somebody could have all of these things and be miserable and have a great life. Not a perfect life, but a great life. So that's why I'm not an objective list theorist either. I think it's not good enough to just add pleasure to the list. The pleasure's got to be connected to the other things on the list. And if you've got the things on the list but no pleasure, yeah, it's not good enough. And if you've got the pleasure but don't really have the things, yeah, that's not good enough. You've got to have pleasure in the things. 
Uh, and that's why it's a hybrid view and not just an objective list view. So is the motivation for the hybrid view is just that it, it doesn't suffer from the difficulties that you might identify with the three versions of utilitarianism that we just discussed? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a large part of it, is that each of the familiar theories, hedonism, desire theory, objective list theories, all seem to have intuitive objections. And this theory seems to have the virtues of the other theories, uh, but avoid the intuitive objections. Now, of course, not everybody votes the same way on these questions, right? Some people, as I mentioned, do sign up for the uh, experience machine, so they're not going to want my kind of hybrid view. But at least this kind of view matches uh, the, the, the basic intuitions that I have thinking about the, 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 the simpler theories. That's not the only thing that's to be said in favor of it. I mean, you've got to work out the details of this theory and certain structures begin to emerge. And then maybe these structures have independent plausibility. Uh, but as a first pass, at least, why move hybrid? Because it does a better job of matching our intuitions about who's got a good life and who doesn't than the simpler theories have. Right. Going back to normal utilitarianism, what are some arguments uh, one might give in favor of utilitarianism? What, which ones do you find the most persuasive? Well, the most persuasive argument is the one I sketched at the beginning, namely consequentialism is pretty attractive. Welfareism is pretty attractive. Utilitarianism is just the name we have for the combination of those two views. So utilitarianism is pretty attractive. There are subtler arguments one can give. Partly, you can argue for the view in the way I just talked about. Another way you can talk about it is to point out that this would hardly be surprising, given that the two pieces that make up utilitarianism are both attractive, is that when you think about the implications of utilitarianism for particular cases, in a very wide range of cases, it gives not only what intuitively seems to be the right answer, it seems to give a plausible enough explanation about why it's the right answer. So part of what the argument for utilitarianism is, is it matches not just our intuitions about those two abstract philosophical principles, consequentialism and welfareism, it also matches our more specific intuitions about particular cases for a, a very wide range of cases uh, and uh, offers plausible explanations as to why uh, those uh, answers are indeed the right answer. So just to take a trivial example, um, although I teach at Yale and have for many years now, I used to teach at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And in order to get to work, I would take the L, that's the elevated, uh, and at a certain point, it went underground, so a more familiar subway-like system. And I had to change trains. And to get from the one train to the other train, I had to walk through a long tunnel. And as it happens, when I was going, it was after rush hour because you know academics classes were later in the day. Uh, so the tower was the, the tunnel was often empty, uh, and not completely empty. There'd be one person there. It was a blind man who sold pencils. Uh, and, you know, what he was hoping was you'd go up, take a pencil and put, you know, a quarter or a dollar or whatever it might be, you know, into his cup. But it occurred to me in my corruptness uh, that uh, I could go up, pretend I was about to uh, buy a pencil from him and just take the money from his cup. And he'd be none the wiser. Uh, and nobody else would see me because the tunnel was empty. Now, I suppose that we all have the judgment that that's wrong. And <laughs> utilitarianism says that it's wrong. Uh, why is it wrong? Uh, utilitarianism says it's wrong because the benefit that I get by stealing a dollar from a blind man's cup, that's, that's benefit and that's relevant. But the harm that I'd be doing to the, to the blind man is much, much greater. He needs the dollar much more than I do. And so if in, in between these two simple choices, give him a dollar or steal a dollar, which outcome has the better outcome, which, which act has the better outcome in terms of uh, uh, the actions, well, from a welfare's point of view, we count everybody's welfare, his and mine, nobody else is relevant. He's got a lot more welfare on the table than I do. Uh, so it was wrong, it would have been wrong to steal. So utilitarianism gave the right answer there, and it seems to have a pretty plausible explanation as to why it's the wrong answer, you know, why it's the, why it's wrong to, to, to steal, why that's the right answer. So 
you know, you can multiply cases like this a gazillion times. And so that also adds to the attractiveness and the cumulative argument for utilitarianism. There's yet another strand that one can do in arguing for utilitarianism. One can point to rival theories, which we haven't yet really talked about, but there are other, of course, theories of morality. And in those other theories of morality, other things matter besides just trying to bring about the best results, in particular, as much welfare as possible. Um, and so other theories introduce other factors with other distinctions. They draw other lines and they endow them with moral significance. And one of the things that one can do is, as a, a defender of utilitarianism, is start attacking those other lines. Challenge the rival theorists to explain what exactly do these distinctions come to and why do they matter and will they really sort cases in the way that uh, you were hoping they would? Are they going to lead to unintuitive implications? And if so, which theory does a better job in terms of our intuitions? My original utilitarianism or your rival theory, right? Probably no moral theory is going to get a perfect score in terms of matching all of our intuitions. Certainly utilitarianism doesn't. So it always becomes a comparative matter. Which job, which rival theory can do a better job of matching our intuitions on the one hand? and do a better job of offering an underlying theoretical rationale of the sort that I offered at the beginning, talking about consequentialism and, and, and welfareism. So one way that you, you know, the, the slogan, I don't know anything about sports, but, you know, there's a slogan that gets quoted, uh, you know, the best defense is a good offense. So one other strand of defending utilitarianism is going on the offense against rival non-utilitarian theories and pressing these people to explain what distinctions are the ones that they really believe in and how do you make that distinction precise and will it really do what you want it to do once you've made it precise. And that turns out to be a very, very difficult thing for the non-utilitarians to do. And so that gives some extra support to the pro-utilitarian argument. One argument I find myself uh, pretty attracted to is, well, I should, I should say this. One argument I think that's, that supports utilitarianism. It's not really an argument. It's more so like a thought experiment, and that's the trolley problem. Sure. It's pretty easy, like, how the two theories would respond, like deontology versus utilitarianism. It's pretty easy to see how they'd respond differently to that sort of case. The utilitarian says, well, obviously you should kill one, say five, because that's a better consequence than the alternative action of letting the five die. Whereas the deontologist um, would say, like, no, killing one is morally it's always wrong to like let's say intentionally kill like another human being and by pulling the switch you're intentionally killing another human being so i think the trolley problems actually or the trolley thought experiments a good argument in favor of utilitarianism but do you do you disagree with that what do you think about like that way of supporting utilitarianism so good so first you, you introduce the term of jargon so great so let's just be clear you know so I was talking about non-utilitarian rival theories, and the most familiar family of such theories are deontological ones, where roughly speaking, the idea is that certain actions can be wrong even if the results would be good. If you say that, you're a deontologist, and you've rejected the consequentialist strand. We've, you know, we've not only rejected utilitarianism, we can identify why did utilitarianism go wrong. It went wrong in embracing consequentialism. It's not that consequences don't matter, but the consequentialist makes the bolder claim that consequences are all that matters. The deontologist says, no, certain actions are wrong, excuse me, even if the results would be good. All right. And there are cases that seem to, su to support this thought. Now, it's one thing to say there are cases that seem to support this thought. It's another thing to spell out, all right, so then what's the extra rule that we need to add into our theory? And many deontologists propose, you, know, you, were, you were basically just assuming all this, I just want to get it all on the table. Many deontologists assume or think that the relevant line is between doing harm and allowing harm, uh, and there's a prohibition against doing harm. In fact, it's so, so specially morally objectionable to do harm that it can be wrong to do harm, even if the results would be better if you did harm. All right, so that's, a, that's also a pretty attractive thought. We didn't give any examples, but it's a pretty attractive thought. We can give an example if you want. Um, and so that puts pressure against consequentialism. But then, as you say, we face the trolley problem. Uh, when, we, when we remember the trolley example where the train's going to hit five unless we divert it onto a sidetrack where we'll hit and kill, you know, one. 
Um, most people, not everybody, but most people think it's permissible to throw the switch. But when you throw the switch, you're clearly killing the one on the side trap. And wasn't the deontologist insisting a minute ago that there's a deontological prohibition against killing innocent people, even if the results would be better? So you can't defend throwing the switch by saying, oh, I'm saving the five, because we just said as deontologists, that ain't a good enough justification. It's wrong to kill people. All right, so good. That's an objection. Well, what is it? You said that's an argument for utilitarianism. And if we're scorekeeping, I suppose it is an argument in favor of utilitarianism. But it doesn't. it's not a decisive argument because there are other deontologists who say all that shows is that this initial attempt to spell out a deontological position was too hasty. It drew the wrong line. It drew the line in the wrong place. The, the relevant extra distinction isn't between doing and allowing, it's something else. And what a deontologist who wants to favor throwing the switch, I mean, some deontologists will say, no, no, you can't throw the switch. And then, of course, they've got an easier time in responding to the prob- problem, the trolley problem. But any deontologist who wants to say, no, it's permissible to throw the switch, and yet for all that utilitarianism is wrong, they need to draw the line some other way, Right? And now that's a that's a research program project. That's a program. Now you need to, f- to ask, well, what better lines could we draw? So there are various proposals that have been made, and some of them are very very complicated. Um, I think here in particular of the work of Frances Cam, uh, who uh, used to teach at NYU. Then she was at Harvard for a number of years, and uh, recently she moved to Rutgers. Uh, her way of drawing the lines very very complicated. But there are other proposals that are fairly simple, like the so-called doctrine of double effect, which says, I'll I'll, I'll skip some of the technical details and just jump to to kind of the bottom line. It's especially wrong to harm somebody as a means of achieving your goal. But if the harm is merely a side effect of achieving your goal, of the way you go about achieving your goal, that's okay. At least it could be okay. Um, Well, That view, the doctrine of double effect, can also permit throwing the trolley uh, switch. Because when you throw the trolley switch, the harm to the person on the sidetrack isn't a means of saving the five. And we can see that by imagining a scenario where you throw the switch and then the side person gets off the track before the trolley gets to them. You know, you're not going to say, oh, darn, my plans have been ruined, (laughs) you know. It doesn't matter to you whether they get hurt. That doesn't help you save the five. It's just diverting the tra- trolley is what helps you save the five. So that shows that the harm to the one isn't a means, and that shows it's not prohibited by the doctrine of double effect. And yet the doctrine of double effect does say you cannot harm as a means, even if the result would be good. So it's still a deontological position. And what this shows is no single simple thought experiment is likely to do the trick of just dis- helping us decide what moral view is correct. You need to think through many, many, many different thought experiments. You need to look beneath the hood and ask, what's the underlying theoretical rationale? Um, do the principles that are the, are the ingredients in making this uh, theory up, are they attractive or are they unattractive? You've got to keep score and compare your score to, to your rivals. It's one of the reasons why doing moral philosophy is difficult. Uh, that no single thought experiment settles it. Uh, you have to take all of these arguments, bring them all to bear, and ask which view seems to do the best job on balance as compared to all the alternatives I've thought of. Right. I guess, like, one thing I do like about the trial problem is, though, is that I kind of have the intuition it's always right to kill one to save five. And so, like, if I'm talking to, like, one of my Catholic friends, for example, and they introduce, like, the doctrine of double effect, I'll say, well, what about the loop trolley problem? Right. But don't go to the loop trolley problem. That one, I think, is tricky. I mean, I really think it's a uh, very uh, complicated one in ways that not, aren't always appreciated. Uh, go to what sometimes gets called the fat man version or the, uh, the uh, bridge version where um, it's a matter of in order to stop the train, there's no diverting onto a sidetrack. There is no sidetrack, but there's just a very overweight person next to you. You've got to imagine that you yourself are too skinny. 
But if you threw the fat man off the bridge, he would land on the track. The train would hit him, kill him, but it would, he weighs enough that he'd stop the train. Now, almost everybody, you know, it's only you and I, so we weren't voting here intuitively. I mean, not, not a very big sample. Almost everybody thinks it's perfectly fine intuitively and has the intuition it's perfectly fine to throw the switch in the trolley. But again, I've discussed this with thousands of people over the years. Um, almost everybody thinks it's wrong to throw the fat man. I certainly have the intuition that it's wrong to throw the fat man. Don't you have the intuition that it's wrong to throw the fat man? I'll say this, it repulses me to do it, but when I think about it intellect and like I in terms of what I would actually do in real life, I wouldn't do it. But like intellectually when I think about it objectively, I totally think that's the right thing to do. Okay, good. So look, what you just said, these are not your exact words, but I'll paraphrase what you just said is you have the intuition that it's wrong to throw the fat man. You don't endorse that intuition. On reflection, you have decided it's permissible to throw the fat man. But of course, part of the reason you have rejected your intuition is because you can't see what overall attractive moral theory might allow us to give the intuitive judgment about trolley, give the intuitive judgment about fat man, namely that you can't throw it, right? You you have reflected enough that you think there's no good rival theory. So the, the only alternatives is a deontology that, you know, says it's wrong to throw uh, the switch in trolley or a utilitarianism that gives the wrong answer, intuitively wrong answer about fat man. No theory is going to get a perfect score. You've weighed it up, and you think, on balance, utilitarianism gets a better score. That's fine, as far as it goes. But that's, of course, always a conditional, tentative judgment. If somebody comes along and has a better theory that matches a better number of your intuitions, you got to you know, wonder about it, right? So look, we mentioned the doctrine of double effect. Doctrine of double effect says trolley, that's okay, because the harm to the person is just a side effect. Fat man, that's not okay. Why? Because the harm to the fat man is your means of saving the five. And that's prohibited by the doctrine of double effect. After all, if the fat man landed on the track, and then, just like the person on the side track where you didn't care, got up off the track before the train hit him, you'd say, my plans have been ruined. You'd have to run down off the bridge and try to push him back on the track. And that shows the harm to this guy is not a mere side effect. It's the very means by which you're going to save the five. All right. So, so far, if we were just scoring in terms of intuitions, utilitarianism got one right answer. It got the right answer for trolley and one wrong answer. It got the wrong answer about fat man. The... Doctrine of double effect got two right answers. It got intuitively. It got the right answer about trolley and the right answer about fat man. So right now, the doctrine of double effect has a better score than utilitarianism. And that means if you're going to say, nonetheless, I still prefer utilitarianism, you've got some choices, but they're all, all of them going to involve you've got your work cut out for you. And you could say, forget intuitions. I don't care about the fact that pushing the fat man off seems like intuitively the right thing. Um, intuitions are irrelevant for doing ethics. But that's a double-edged sword, because if you say that, you're going to have to say, wait a minute, forget intuitions with regard to trolley. When you were saying, Sam, that you thought it was an advantage of utilitarianism that it gave the intuitively right answer in trolley, you're going to have to give that up if intuitions aren't any kind of right so that's, that's a pretty big cost to pay, right? The, uh, another alternative is to dig beneath the hood, as I put it a couple of times, and try to ask, all right, we've got a principle, um, a doctrine of double effect. What are the distinctions exactly that it makes use of? Harm as the means versus harm as a side effect. What exactly does that distinction really come to? Once we understand what a consistent will it, you know, give us, can we see why that would matter? After all, the principles behind utilitarianism, consequentialism and welfarists, seemed 
attractive in their own right. If we could get clear on what the underlying pieces, the ingredients that fed into the doctrine of, of double effect, would they also seem attractive? If not, maybe that's an argument against it. You know, I mentioned Francis Cam has a really complicated view. You know, that principle, when you state Cam's principle, doesn't seem very intuitively attractive to me. You know, so that's one thing we do. But now we've really got to get into the weeds. We can't just in a high-handed way say, oh, I always vote. Uh, if, 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 you, if you've got, if you appeal to intuitions, you got to admit it's a strike against utilitarianism and fat men, and you've got your work cut out for you. Another thing to do, of course, is to say, yeah, there are still other cases, right? You mentioned the loop variant, and people sometimes claim that the loop variant is an argument against the doctrine of double effect, and maybe that's right, and maybe, but of course, all that shows is that the doctrine of double effect doesn't get a perfect score either. I said several minutes ago, I don't think any moral theory is going to get a perfect score in terms of everything we need to be doing uh, to argue for or against. And so that's, that can't, the loop can't be a knockdown argument against uh, 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 the doctrine of double effect, just like fat man can't be a knockdown argument against uh, utilitarianism. We're going to need to not only consider two, three, five, a dozen, 50, a hundred different cases, and we're going to have to look at beneath the hood and think what the micro principles are. Working out what's the right moral theory is a really, really complicated undertaking. I actually think there's an even more devastating objection to utilitarianism than the fat man case. Don't get me wrong, I, I have the I have the intuition that would be a repugnant thing to do, but I feel like the most solid objection is really like the one that Thompson considers, where like I think you got you call him Chuck and like normative ethics, you harvest yeah. his organs. And you yeah, yeah them to the five. Right, right. It's it's a little bit like Fat Man in that you're killing one person as a way of saving five people. In the organ trans, and again, if you if you ask people, almost everybody thinks the organ transplant case uh, is uh, impermissible. It's not okay to chop them up. Uh, and so that's again a very powerful case that speaks against utilitarianism. Um, and uh, now, of course. Our original deontological position, the prohibition against doing harm versus allowing harm, that seems to explain why we can't kill the one to get their organs. Chuck, as you say, I call him. Um, and so you might say one point in favor of the do-allow distinction. Trolley was one point against. All right. Of course, uh, Dr. Double Effect gave the right answer for Trolley, gave the right answer for Fat Man, and gave the right answer for organ transplant so now it's you know three points in favor of you know so right it, there's a lot of cases to think about and and one might you know take the extreme view that we shouldn't ever reject any of our intuitions about cases francis cam doesn't officially believe that but she comes pretty close to that she works very very hard to find a principle that matches gets a high you know, as high a score as possible let's put it that way for uh, matching intuitions about particular cases. And that's what makes the rule end up looking so complicated because there need to be a lot of bends, twists and bends and turns in order to match so many different intuitions. But yeah, that's a possibility, you know, uh, uh, as well. Or we might just have we want a simpler theory and reject some of our intuitions. Uh, and then you've got to be willing to bite the bullet about fat man or bite the bullet about organ transplant case. Um, so, you know, one question is, how much weight should we give to intuitions? Are they infallible? Doesn't seem likely, but are they, you know, should we be really, really, really hesitant before we give them up? Or should we, uh, you know, the other extreme is to say intuitions have no weight at all, but I don't see how you've got to do anything in moral theory without appealing to intuitions. Uh, are, can, can we identify certain classes of intuitions that are more reliable than others? Sidgwick, the other... I mentioned, I think, earlier Bentham and Mill, but so, so Sidgwick, the great 19th century utilitarian, greatest philosopher of the three of them, I think, um, in his book, The Method of Ethics, he did a couple of things that are relevant in terms of the conversation that, we, that we've been having. Uh, he said, of course, intuitions are evidence, but not all intuitions are evidence. We need to ask what are the properties that intuitions should have if we're going to really use them in defending our moral theories. Um, and he thought he could identify certain properties. They had to be clear, they had to be consistent with one another. Everybody who understands and has thought the matter through has to agree about them, so kind of universally shared intuitions. And 
one of the things that Sidgwick did in the Methods of Ethics was he argued that a lot of the intuitions that initially seemed to point to deontological principles, like, you know, don't harm, when you really make them precise, it's less clear whether do we like this version or that version. We run into cases, excuse me, like the trolley problem. He didn't himself know the trolley problem, but he was perfectly aware that deontological prohibitions, when you make them precise, lose some of their intuitive appeal. And so he thought, yeah, that, that weakens the, the case for deontology. And that's part of the, the best defense is a good offense. It's part of the offense against deontological views. And, and then he says, but there are certain intuitions that pass the Sidgwickian tests. And he thought when you combine them uh, uh, and kind of cook well, if you think of combined ingredients and make a cake and stick in the oven, uh, they support a particular theory. In fact, he thinks it supported utilitarianism. So uh, the decision about which intuitions we're going to give, what kinds of weight, and can we de demarcate certain classes to count on or, or count less on, rely less on, can, depending on where you come down on that, push you more in a deontological version or more in a utilitarian version or, or you know, other theories besides to the two main schools that we've been talking about. We're going to need to wrap up in a few minutes. Anything else you wanted to ask? Um, as I th for me, like the organ harvest case is probably, like I said, it's the most devastating objection. But like, I don't really know of like a plausible reply to it. What's the most plausible reply a utilitarian could give to it other than like biting the bullet? What do you think is the most, the best reply a utilitarian can give in response to the organ harvest case? Well, look, some consequentialists not utilitarians, they are non-utilitarian consequentialists, which given what my opening remarks means, they are people who accept the consequentialist theory, but they reject welfareism. They say if we move to a more fancy or sophisticated or non-standard, non-welfareist theory of the good, we can still be consequentialists and we can capture the answer that it's wrong to, to chop up the person in the organ lottery, in the organ transplant case. Um, there's a debate, unsurprisingly, about what's the best way to do that, but I'll give you a quick example to give you a feel for this. Instead of saying whether the welfareist says, yeah, we just need to think about how many lives you've saved, you know, roughly speaking, um, somebody could say, let's call this the sophisticated consequentialist, could say, you know, not all deaths are equal. Death by natural causes is bad, but death by murder is even worse. So if death by natural causes is negative 100, maybe death by murder is negative 10,000. Now, if you say that and then bring that into a consequentialist theory, um, so now you want to still maximize good the good, but it's going to be this more sensitive or complicated theory of the good, it's no longer be, going to be permissible to chop up Chuck because it's no longer one life versus five. It's one death by murder versus five death by natural causes. And so five death by natural causes, that's negative 500. One death by murder is negative 10,000. It's worse if you murder the person. And so at least one possible response within a broadly consequentialist approach to the organ transplant case is to say, Keep the consequentialism, but reject the welfareism. That's still not deontology, but, it, but it's not a utilitarianism either, because you gave up the welfareism. You said other things besides the simple assessment of well-being. We need to have a more complicated theory of the good. But if you really ask, what can a utilitarian say? Well, of course, one thing a utilitarian can say is in real life, you know, in real life, we have organ failure all the time. And so if you kill the one, you know, the, a nice healthy one, you know, it could be a 20-year-old. They could have gone on to live 60 more years, 70 more years, 80 more years. But if you do, if you kill them uh, and do the organ transplant, it could be that in five years all the people have died of organ failure. So it may not really have the best results. And so we can't really know that the results are going to be better. And so even if in terms of some hypothetical example, maybe this would be the right thing to do. In the real world, it would never be the right thing to do. And so there are utilitarians who will say that. Of course, that's to say 
we should distrust intuitions about far-flung, not realistic cases. And now that we're back to the debate I was mentioning a few minutes ago, can we identify cases where the intuitions are less reliable than other ones? Which cases might they be? And one possible answer is to say, science fiction cases, unrealistic cases, sure, we can have negative anti-utilitarian intuitions there, but you, shouldn't, you should give much less weight to those intuitions. Those intuitions are too likely to be misfiring because the case is so unrealistic. That's an answer that utilitarians have sometimes given uh, as well. I think sooner or later you're going to have to admit that there are some cases like the organ transplant case or other cases like that where the results really would be worse uh, if you uh, don't do what utilitarianism says, but intuitively it seems you shouldn't do it. Um, and so sooner or later, I think the utilitarian is going to have to bite the bullet. But again, I know I've been repeating myself. I don't think any moral theory gets a perfect score. Sooner or later, every theory is going to have to bite the bullet. It's going to have to say something that we find intuitively troubling. Uh, and yeah, because if, if, you, if you could explain away all the counterexamples, then you'd be getting a perfect score. And I don't think any moral theory gets a perfect score. It's always the comparative judgment, which one on balance seems best. And, you know, if anything that doing philosophy for more than 40 years has taught me, it's that reasonable, sensible, rational people disagree about, on balance, what moral theory is the, is the most attractive one. Uh, reasonable people can disagree about, even people of goodwill can disagree about moral questions. So although there's a tremendous amount to be said in favor of utilitarianism, um, uh, you know, the argument continues because reasonable people can disagree. Professor Kagan, before I let you go, um, I'm someone who's interested in learning more about utilitarianism and like how it can be defended. Um, are there any books that you'd recommend that I check out if I wanted to just learn more about this? Well, so uh, this is like now an ad from our sponsor. I'll, of course, mention two books by, my, by myself. If you wanted a kind of presentation of utilitarianism, as well as a presentation of some rival deontological views, an overview of some of the debates here, then uh, the first part of my book, Normative Ethics, is, a, I hope, an accessible uh, introduction, uh, suitable you know, for undergraduates. Um, uh, or for that matter, even some graduate students who don't know the, you know, the field as well. Uh, if you wanted a more in the weeds, getting down and really asking themselves what exactly are the most promising distinctions and how exactly one might argue for or against or against them, and what are the other sides that what are the other problems about utilitarianism? Because there are other problems we didn't get to. Um, uh, my first book, The Limits of Morality, um, although it's not a full blown defense of utilitarianism. Uh, offers a lot of relevant material, but that's harder slog. Uh, that was written for uh, professionals, and although I, I, I think it can be read by <laughs> you know, non-professionals, it would be harder reading than the, than the normative ethics book. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mentioned Sidgwick's book, The Methods of Ethics. That's a wonderful book uh, as well. Dull in some parts, but he's a really great philosopher. Very short defense of utilitarianism uh, is by uh, J.J.C. Smart, uh, his contribution to a little volume called Utilitarianism for and Against. He wrote the for essay. Bernard Williams, who was a kind of deontologist, wrote the against essay. So got two books by me, one by uh, Sidgwick, and this little for and against volume. You read these things and you'll have a pretty good feel for uh, a lot of the main issues. Well, Professor Kagan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about these issues, issues with me. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye. Right. Take care.